delightful presenters from Columbia University joining us. We're going to kick things off with Dr. Sinem Karipsin, the Director of Pre-Pregnancy Program at Columbia Fertility Center, and Dr. Vivian Wei, the Assistant Professor of Reproductive Sciences at Columbia Fertility Center. And we're going to hear about spermosaicism and see some cases about that and learn about the sensitivity assay. So I will let them kick it off by sharing their presentation. OK, so we have no disclosures. <coughs> Excellent. So here, I'll just make it a little bit bigger here. You can have a And bigger. also, um, I think this looks good. This looks good to do. You know? yes, and also, um, as a part of uh, this talk, uh, Flora yes. asked us to say this content is our, uh, like uh, in our disclosures, this content is uh, of our own. The slides is not sponsored. This talk is uh, not sponsored by Myriad. So um, the uh, we are going to start with reviewing the role of mosaicism in transmission of genetic diseases, and we'll discuss a new and highly sensitive clinical test that was developed at Columbia University for detecting mosaicism. And uh, with a case, we are going to define the uh, role of those results and the PGTM for de novo variants and we'll wrap up with the review of the steps of study enrollment. Some people said they don't see the slides, so maybe we want to double check the technical. Some people are not seeing the results, the slides. Yes. So, Flora, you could take over the microphone, please. You can right, now. I, I... You can now. Okay. Some people okay. are saying that they click okay. reload and they're able to see it, so... Oh, great. All good. Okay. Okay, Excellent. sounds good. Thanks, Vivian, and thanks, Floria. Okay, so we'll continue. Okay, so why do we need a sensitive assay at, uh, for mosaicism detection? Uh, I'll present two cases showing the two situations that we lack the ability to give personalized reproductive risk counseling. And maybe you have similar cases, similar patients. So the first case is the family, a 31-year-old uh, woman who is the mother of five children, came to us for PGTM and they have two children with developmental delay and structural anomalies. And after evaluation, three of the children tested positive for the 2Q13 uh, microdeletion, and two children tested positive for the TOK1 uh, pathogenic variant. And both parents are healthy and tested negative for those two variants. And so those variants are de novo. And so what I would like to ask to the audience here, how do we counsel a family with a child or pregnancy with a de novo variant for the transmission uh, to the next generation. So when a couple like this, when they present with one child with a de novo variant, most of the time you say, well, uh, this is one of event, very likely, uh, given the population studies, the likelihood of this happening to your child is like one to two percent um, is the percentage that we give to them, but we just don't give them a personalized risk. Now this couple, after having two children, they're told that it's going to be 50%, but with one example, we just really can't give a personalized risk uh, for those individuals with uh, de novo variants of their offspring. Another situation, 
uh, this 29-year-old male with the new diagnosis of neurofibromatosis 1 seeks interest in the uh, sperm mosaicism assay, sensitive assay of mosaicism. Uh, so um, he's 29, he had multiple cafe au lait spots and right inguinal freckle English nodules and a biopsy from a cafe au lait spot showed that he had um, a pathogenic variant in NF1 gene. Same variant was not found in his blood cells. So he uh, was told he was mosaic for NF1 and his risk of uh, transmission to the next generation uh, existed, is what he was told. Uh, and he wanted to get some more information if his sperm carried that variant. So this is another situation that we can't give personalized risk assessment. So why did we start with applying sensitive assay of mosaicism to the sperm? Uh, because uh, first, what? the sample collection what? is non-invasive. Uh, second, from trio studies, we know 80% of the de novo variants face to the paternal haplotype. That makes sense because per second post-adolescent, uh, we uh, men make a thousand new sperm cells. Um, and so it's plenty and it goes through several mitotic cell divisions. So it makes sense during those mitotic divisions, it uh, has errors. And we hypothesize that sperm mosaicism may have been historically underdiagnosed due to the technological limitations. Whole exome sequencing, whole genome sequencing, or targeted deep sequencing have been used in the research setting with a typical cost of 1000 to $2,500, uh, with a typical turnaround time of one to two months, uh, with one in 300, uh, one in 100 sensitivity around that range. Data analysis and interpretation are complex. Uh, and variant allele fraction estimation could be inaccurate due to noisy amplification of those existing methods. And we developed sensitive assay for mosaicism initially to apply it on the sperm uh, and giving the possibility to have a superior platform to the existing platforms. One, by having a higher resolution method with a detection level of, zero, of 0.05%. And we tag sperm with unique identifier, uh, which Vivian will go into the details very shortly, that helps us um, to uh, further validate with Sanger sequencing and give CLIA validated positive results to the referring provider. And uh, we also analyze paternal and uh, maternal saliva samples to further assess for gonosomal mosaicism. So we are not only restricted, restricting it to the sperm, we also involve saliva as a somatic tissue. And also this essay is compatible with Illumina and Nanoporm NGS platforms, allowing um, more uh, wide clinical application. So I'll give an example of a clinical case um, and then um, give the microphone to um, Vivian. So AB uh, seeked our help uh, during the enrolled in our study during the second pregnancy uh, of uh, his partner. Uh, their first pregnancy was unfortunately affected with a rare skeletal dysplasia. And the whole exome sequencing from amniocentesis sample showed de novo um, likely pathogenic variant in F a uh, FAM111A gene, and that pregnancy was 
terminated at 23 weeks. So they uh, conceived naturally and um, presented to our women's genetics team. And uh, at that time, they were enrolled in uh, our study. And I'll pass this to Vivian. Thank you, Sinan. Um, teaming with Sinam, I'm um, giving some technical background of our SAM method and how we were able to use it to achieve high detection sensitivity and low sequencing error for sperm mosaic and detection. So we would first start by collecting semen sample from patient uh, using a cell collection kit that the Columbia University Fertility Center developed and offered. Um, with this, patient has the option to self-collect the semen sample at home and drop off the sample at the fertility center. If they are too far away, they can also choose to send in the sample using FedEx uh, by next day delivery. Upon receiving the semen sample, we would recover the multi-sperm by using either gradient centrifugation or microfluidic devices. Oh, I need to uh, mention that I'm giving some of the technical background that if you have any question at any time, feel free to leave a comment or stop me for asking questions. Um, with the multi-sperm that we recover, we extract the genomic DNA from the multi-sperm. And then as what Sinan has mentioned, we would prepare a sequencing library using two rounds of PCR to amplify our target of interest. We were also able to attach a unique molecule identifier on each of our amplicons so that we would be able to chase back the original sperm DNA template. When we do the uh, data analysis, we actually generate really deep coverage at uh, our target of interest. At this case, about 1 million weed coverage at uh, our targeted mutation. And at such a high depth of uh, sequencing uh, coverage, the sequencing noise will normally kick in and blending with the low level of mosaicism. Um, then you can actually look at the uh, UMI information and combine all the sequences with the same UMI into one cluster that representing they were all from the same sperm DNA template origin. So each of the cluster actually represented the same uh, uh, each of the sperm DNA template that we started with. And then with this sample, we were able to analyze our patient A B sample, and we generated 1.5 million with coverage for our target of interest. And with them, we formed more than 173,000 clusters, but most of them are just sequencing noises. We only look at the cluster that has high width support that was truly from a actual um, sperm template. We got 43,191 cluster of those. Among them, 2,378 of them actually detected the, our targeted pathogenic mutation, indicating that in this a patient sample, there was about 5.5% of the semen that carries the pathogenic mutation. And the below panel, I am showing a graphic example on how the clustering process helped us to identify low level uh, mutation among sequencing noise and PCR amplification errors. You can see when we sequence the target of interest to really deep, it's very hard to distinguish from a low level true mutation from the sequencing noises when looking at the bulk sequences. But when we cluster them based on the UMI information, because all the sequences from the same cluster, they were originated from the same DNA template, they were uniform to each other. So making it very straightforward to distinguish a cluster from a healthy sperm and a cluster from a sperm that was carrying the pathogenic mutation. With the help of UMI, we were able to identify the other positive clusters, and we were even able to 
further validate the detected positive cluster by clear Sanger sequencing so that we can pass the information to the patient. And then I'm giving my microphone back to Sinam so that she can continue with the clinical part. Thank you so much, Vivian, and thanks for being the brains of the study too. So, um, so I'll go back to our FM11A uh, patient and uh, so even though his sperm had 5% uh, of that FAM11A uh, variant, the anatomy scan was normal and their uh, amniocentesis uh, was negative for this variant and they had their child, so it was uh, a happy story for them. I'll present a case for PGTM for de novo uh, variants. And so the indications of PGTM is expanding. And um, I think in uh, a lot of IVF centers, we see cancer predisposition, cardiac uh, conditions, uh, neurodegenerative disorders, uh, or variants of unknown significance getting tested. But um, uh, we also see de novo pathogenic variants of one of the parents, or both of the parents sometimes, or of the offspring when the parents are, parents are negative, go through PGTM. So I'll present one of our patients that the offspring had the de novo variant, their child had the de novo variant, and the parents were negative. So, um, 30 year old, a mother of one, he has a two year old son, Elliot. He, Elliot has primary immunodeficiency due to PLCG2 de novo variant. And most of his lifetime, he was in the hospital and they need a bone marrow transplant for Elliot. They needed to do PGTHLA. And as they're doing PGTHLA, um, they wanted to see if PGTM for this variant was possible. Um, we um, tested his sperm, the dad's sperm, uh, for uh, this de novo variant. And it was a negative, but you know, it's only test the sperm and statistically like 20% it could come from the egg. And also this is a very high sensitive test, uh, but this couples, th these couples are very worried. And for uh, as they are testing the embryos for HLA, um, they wanted to uh, test for the possibility of the embryos having the same variant. So she went through the cycle, um, very good response, 18 eggs retrieved. And um, if you uh, look at the variant assessment of all of the embryos uh, that formed, uh, all seven of the embryos tested negative for this variant, and two of them were HLA match, and one was negative uh, for aneuploidy and HLA match. So, uh, and they, she had a successful embryo transfer and had her healthy baby in 2022. And both children are thriving well, doing well. So, um, so how does, uh, do you enroll your patients for the uh, sperm mosaicism the assay? Just we call it SAM, you have seen it on the slides, sensitive assay for mosaicism. Um, and um, so if your um, uh, patient has a de novo variant identified in their offspring, it could be a previous pregnancy uh, or child, uh, or uh, if you have a patient with known mosaicism, this could be your NF1 patient, tuberous sclerosis patient, or pic 3 ca variant patient, but uh, a person, male patient with known mosaicism also applies in the study. Is the variant present in the sperm is the question. So you could send information to me. I put the QR code uh, of uh, the um, 
uh, web page that takes you to uh, filling in the patient information. We just need patient contact information and molecular diagnostic report. Um, so, uh, and Flora will share uh, this uh, study handout with you as well. So, uh, what happens after the patient enrolls? Our study coordinator, uh, Stephanie, contacts the patient. Contacts the patient. Uh, she does the consenting all online. It doesn't matter if your patient lives in another state. So, we had patients all over the country. The second patients. Uh, the NF1 patient, the study is ongoing, but it's an out-of-state patient um, and uh, all on the West Coast. And so uh, collection kits are sent to the patients, pl uh, sperm plus or minus saliva samples. A very common question, do we need any um, uh, POC tissue or previous uh, uh, pregnancy or uh, child's DNA? No, uh, we don't need it in, so far in none of our cases we need it, but um, it's, um, and then we um, ship the sample uh, kits uh, with the, uh, to the patient and then uh, they ship it back to us. There's a turn label included and the turnaround time from the time that we give the results um, is, um, is uh, eight weeks. And this is our um, uh, investigators in the study and uh, study coordinator, Stephanie, and the, two, the final words about our study. So SAM is a robust platform for detecting and clinically de validating low level of sperm mosaicism. And this technology is useful for reproductive genetic counseling and recurrence risk assessment, but you know, uh, this is uh, something that may give reassurance uh, to some individuals seeing it negative, they may uh, decide to pursue natural conception. But even though this is a very, very sensitive platform, 0.05% uh, detection, we will never say it's zero risk of uh, transmitting to future generations, uh, but it still gives them a peace of mind. And um, so at-risk individuals may uh, consider prenatal diagnostic testing, uh, IVF, pre-implantation genetic testing, uh, or sperm donation. Uh, so this could help shape their reproductive decisions. So um, a couple of words about the pre-pregnancy genetics program at Columbia. So we are uh, looking at um, the uh, giving reproductive options from a multidisciplinary perspective. It's not like you're coming to a fertility clinic and you're pushed to doing IVF. We give expert genetic counseling by our expert genetic counselors multiple disciplines, um, multiple genetic counselors from other fields. Uh, they uh, help the families shape their reproductive decisions. And um, the um, and this is our uh, uh, team at Columbia Fertility. And thanks to my wonderful partners for uh, giving the care to our patients together. Thank you so much for your attention. I think we are uh, before that 30 minute mark. Sorry about the technical difficulties in the beginning. So I'll pass to you, uh, Flora, please. Thank you so much. Thank you for this presentation and sharing about the sperm mosaicism. Definitely quite advanced uh, in the last, I'd say 10, 15 years. Um, do we have any questions from the audience or any other cases anybody thought of um, that you'd wanna bring up? I think there's a question from Irene. Yes. Yes, hi. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank you for a great presentation. This has been very educational. Uh, so I have a question for Sinem. Uh, I was just going to ask in regards to the mosaicism in the sperm, you brought up some interesting cases, and I did have one or two cases, like you said, of neurofibromatosis, where they were considered to be de novo mutations, but, you know, the family had more than one affected child, which was obviously pointing towards 
uh, the possibility of germinal mosaicism. And, you know, that would be, I probably saw that couple 10, 12 years ago, and I don't remember what they elected to do at the end. But obviously, in a situation like this nowadays, uh, we could have at least answered the question of whether there is germinal mosaicism in the sperm. The possibility of germinal mosaicism in the egg still remains, right? But the one thing I was going to ask is if, let's say, germinal mosaicism was affecting 5% of the sperm, and I would go ahead to recommend PGTM for that particular mutation, um, A, mathematically, that probably would have affected a small percentage of their embryos. And B, I assume that would have caused a few challenges into establishing phase, right? Because you're talking about the de novo mutation, they need the other embryos in order to establish phase, right? And they probably need affected and unaffected embryos. So if it's only affecting a small percentage of what the couple produces, it can still be a challenge to establish phase within one cycle. Am I correct? Irene, uh, first of all, I'm so happy to see, uh, hear your voice and see you be uh, attending to this conference. And I see your group too. So thank you so much. Yeah, the whole your, group is here. Uh, yes. It's, um, so the... Um, First question uh, uh, that I'll answer is establishing phase. So uh, basically, um, for um, let's say if he was this man that I gave an example of the 29 year old with the neurofibromatosis, right? So when we are establishing the phase, we may use the DNA from the, the PGT lab. We'll use the DNA from the cafe au lait spots uh, from him. And uh, so they may be able to, uh, like without challenge, establish uh, the PGT test development uh, for those patients. And the direct variant analysis is the most of the time the approach uh, that's used for de novo cases. So uh, it really, um, it does not close the door uh, to, um, like if we have an affected issue that's documented with the variant, uh, it may help with the test development. Um, so that's number one. And the second question that you have um, with the risk assessment. So. We provide a variant allele fraction if somebody has a positive test to the result, uh, or we just um, even uh, like we always give that level. But that five percent versus um, like ten percent versus um, like higher or lower is just a really um, saying is higher than the general population that's coded like in the population studies, one to two percent. And it's actually um, the doctor and the patient's discussion whether they want to take that risk and pursue with PGTM for that. So one person could interpret that, OK, it's detected in uh, more than what's um, the availability, clinical detectability of this test. So I have a risk, I'll pursue PGTM for it. And also there could be a, a patient like the case that I presented, the HLA case, uh, it was not detected. And they said, well, it's great. It gives us some reassurance, but we may as well do PGTM for it. And I see several people, but the very first case that I presented with the two variants, uh, TOK1 and uh, 2Q13 uh, du uh, deletion case, micro deletion case, that couple, they did IVF and PGTM, and from their embryos, uh, the variants uh, were detected in their embryos too. So uh, they have two affected children, so it's direct variant analysis. Uh, from uh, their uh, two affected children, like the markers are developed um, um, from their two affected children. Does this answer your question, Irene? Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. Thank well, you very much. Thank you. And also in the like genetic counselors, uh, like 
it's like I saw in the comments that Stephanie made, like, oh, like we didn't, uh, one of the um, uh, audience, uh, somebody from the audience asked, uh, well, uh, we didn't know PGTM for DeNova existed. We, uh, we thought that we needed uh, other family members. So, uh, and Stephanie, exactly, I'm just rephrasing and verbalizing what Stephanie said. So if we uh, have a uh, previous pregnancy tissue uh, or an affected child just by using that DNA, uh, the testing could be uh, possible. Uh, for those and um, and also we see like more and more de novos that was not possible before uh, to uh, have it developed, have the testing developed. Thank you so much. Very Thank informative. You. Any other questions? All right. Well, thank you to our presenters. Uh, hope everybody had a good time and have a good rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting us. And also, Flora, please share with the group yes. uh, the I, handouts. Thank you. Hand so out, if anybody has wants a reference for that study, do go ahead and email me. Yes. And if anyone's yes. interested in presenting in the future, reach out to Flora and I. We'd love to continue these. Yes, yeah, thanks thank all. You.